Good afternoon. I'm David Sobey, the co-founder and CEO of Happy Returns. For those of you that don't know Happy Returns yet, we're tackling the painful challenge of returning products purchased online. We sell return software and reverse logistics to online retailers, which puts us exactly at the intersection of physical and digital commerce. And it's our position at this juncture where e-commerce meets the physical world that I'm excited to talk to you about today, specifically about the remarkable resurgence of the physical store in the retail equation. So let's start by going through a narrative that everyone in this room knows well. And that's the idea that physical retail is dead. Another casualty in the software is eating the world narrative that says e-commerce is the future while stores are a thing of the past. This narrative is so pervasive in America today that the term retail apocalypse has its own Wikipedia entry. And to be fair, there's plenty of data to support this thesis. Take last year, for example. While Amazon stock soared to new highs, 9,300 stores closed their doors. 9,300 stores last year, making it the worst year ever for store closures. And it wasn't just the worst year by a little bit. It was the worst year by a long shot. Store closures up 60% year over year in what was otherwise a thriving US economy. Storied names went bankrupt last year, including the largest retail liquidation in history when Payless Shoe Source went bankrupt. Following Payless were brands that we all know and love, places like Barney's, Gymboree, Tom's, Fred's, Charming Charlie, Charlotte Russe, and what has to be the all-time worst name for a women's apparel brand ever, Dress Barn. While physical retail was failing, e-commerce racked up its 20th straight year of double-digit growth. And all the success stories you heard about last year are are brands that sell direct to consumer via the internet. Brands that many of you in this room have funded. Names like Allbirds and Rothy's, Everlane, Warby Parker, and Away. And all of these brands have been following the same playbook. Make a quality product. Sell direct to consumer, cutting out the middleman. Have a site with a minimalist aesthetic and sans serif fonts. Pay some influencers to authentically promote your brand and make sure that your LTV to CAC ratio is three or higher. So if physical retail is dead and e-commerce is the future, what do we make of this image? Let me set the stage for you. It's holiday 2017. It's December in New York City. It's cold outside. There's snow on the ground. Yet despite the weather, shoppers have lined up not only out the door, but around the block to be the first ones to go into Everlane's first ever physical store. Now, it's possible to dismiss Everlane as a cult brand, but this scene played itself out in city after city with brand after brand in the last couple of years. And these aren't just single store flagships. Everlane followed up on its success in Soho by opening a store in San Francisco, then a third in Brooklyn, then a fourth here in LA on Abbott Kinney. Untuck It has 80 stores today. Warby Parker has over 100, and Casper's promised Wall Street 200 doors in the next three years. So the D2C playbook clearly has a new chapter in it that's called opening stores. So what do we make of this dichotomy? How do you explain that incumbents who started with stores and bolted on e-commerce are failing, where D2C brands that started with e-commerce are finding success adding stores? Now, I'm the proud parent of a sixth grade pre-algebra student, and I'm pretty sure that there's a property that tells me in theory that the two sides of this equation should be equal. But as we've talked about, in reality, they're most definitely not. So the key question is why? I would argue that there's five reasons why. Technology, data, focus, distribution, and cost. So let's unpack these. From a technology perspective, if ever there was a time when it was good to be fashionably late to the party, it's technology. If you started a D2C brand in the last five to 10 years, chances are you picked your technology platform off the shelf. This meant that you were starting your business with a tech stack that was scalable, that was meant to scale. The incumbents never had this choice. And so what they did is they hired engineers and cobbled together what they could in the market and built their own versions of technology. Now along comes the internet. What do the incumbents do? Well, unfortunately, they make the fatal error of thinking it's different. So they hire new people, develop new budgets, new timelines, and make the fatal error of building a second tech stack. Now they have years worth of projects ahead of them to try to integrate these two and come up with some omni-channel dream. And speaking of channels, my gosh, in retail, we love to talk about channels. We've been talking about channels for the last 10 years. And I think it's been a huge distraction to the incumbents. I mean, I can remember going to the NRF show in New York to talk about what's happening in stores. And then three months later, 
going to Vegas to the shop.org show to talk about what's happening in e-commerce. I'm seeing the same people, and we're acting like these are two different conversations. Um, if you're a D2C brand, you had one channel, which is the internet. And as we talked about, the barriers to entry were low, so you had no choice but to focus on the customer experience. Let's go back and talk about data for a minute. If you're a D2C firm, you're sitting on a treasure trove of data, order data, customer data. And it's pretty straightforward to take an email list or a list of physical addresses and append all the demographic data that you need to really understand a profile of who your customer is. Now try to figure that out in a store. It's possible to have customers walk in the store, buy stuff, and have no idea who they are. Let's talk about distribution for a minute. I think it'd be illustrative to talk about two cult shoe brands in the last decade. In the D2C corner, we've got Rothy's. There's only two places where you can buy a pair of Rothy's. On the Rothy's website or at the Rothy's store. Now let's talk about Tom's. I can buy Tom's at Nordstrom. I can buy Tom's at Nordstrom.com. I can buy Tom's at Nordstrom Rack. Tomshoes.com, the Tom store. You get the idea. And if I'm a shopper buying the same product potentially from different places, you're making me do the work to figure out where the price is best. All of a sudden, my experience with the brand gets very diluted. Rothy's controls the experience at each one of those interaction points. Finally, let's talk about cost. So here's another case where the retail apocalypse actually helped the D2C brands. When they went to open stores, it was a buyer's market. And so what did they do? They started by experimenting with pop-ups. And then when they went to sign leases, they, they, they had the ability to demand flexible terms. D2C brands had also already figured out how to sell and, and fulfill directly from a warehouse. So the idea of having a huge store wasn't necessary. What they ended up with was smaller stores with limited inventory. And anytime somebody wanted something, they could fulfill it in a couple days. Bonobos, you'll all remember, took this idea uh, with a guide shop, right? A perfect store that had one item of everything and no inventory. The incumbents, on the other hand, had gotten really good from a supply chain perspective at filling their stores with inventory. And so what they did is they signed up for 10-year leases with big boxes, and all those leases had rent increases each year. Which side do you think had the advantage? So in closing, I think the store is here again. I think the store is here to stay, which, which leads to a natural next question, which is, David, how many stores should a D2C brand have? Um, I think the jury's still out there. I don't know if we'll know the answer, but I think the days of having six, 700 doors like a Macy's are clearly over. I'll tell you what I'd do if I was the CEO of a D2C company. I'd start by selling online direct to consumer. I'd establish product market fit. And once I had a couple years worth of data, I'd start experimenting with stores, first with pop-ups, and then with small footprint stores with flexible lease terms in markets that I knew were core to me. And for everything else, I'd partner with a company like Happy Returns to make sure that I could enable buy online, return to store in all the markets where I didn't have a physical presence. I'm David Sobey. Thank you.